As an evolutionist, what matters is that genes are causal agents, contradicting Dennis's statement, um, they are not active causes, they are active causes. How, how do we ever recognize a cause? Well, I think the answer is this. We do an experiment, we manipulate. You cannot show that something's a cause unless you manipulate. And it's a very trivial example. Suppose you have a, a hypothesis that a cock crows every time a church clock um, tolls. tolls. So you, you observe a correlation that the, 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 the clock tolls and the, and the cock crows. <laughs> Now, is, the, is, is it causal? The only way to be sure is to do an experiment. Climb up into the clock tower and change the clock or manipulate the clock. Ideally, make the clock toll at random. And then, if the cock crows, uh, then you've shown a causal link. In the case of genes, we know that if you, were to, if you mutate a gene, then it will change the phenotype more importantly for an evolutionist, that change will go on to the next generation and the next and the next and the next and potentially forever. Um, whereas if you change anything else, no matter how important it may be causally in the embryology of the animal, if you break a leg, circumcise a penis, do anything else, it will not be transmitted into future generations and that's the crucial difference. I love that introduction Richard because 30 years ago I did precisely that experiment. Uh, let's go through it carefully because I think the experiment is important. Um, this was work done with my colleague from Italy Dario Di Francesco and what we discovered in that work about 30 years ago was that a particular protein and therefore the gene it's an HCN protein so it's an HCN gene that was responsible for the great majority of the cardiac rhythm actually can be knocked out or the protein blocked and hardly any change in rhythm. The association levels between the cock crow and the, the bell or whatever it was, I've forgotten now, um, the association levels are actually generally with a few outlier genes that are very clearly um, terribly important to the organism, they can be overridden by the rest of the organism, you see. And that's exactly what was happening in our cardiac pacemaker work. What we showed is uh, the rhythm goes like that. Uh, that's what's happening in your heart now. And uh, it goes with a particular frequency. Let's give it 80, 80 beats per minute. You block this particular component, which we know, as a matter of physiology, contributes 80% of the rhythm generating electric current. And you knock it out, there's hardly any change in frequency. Now, I think what is happening is that organisms are terribly robust. They know how to manage with whatever genes they happen to have. So uh, what I think is happening there is simply that another network is operating. We actually have identified that network too, so we, we've done all of those experiments already. And I think the genome-wide association study people have done this endlessly uh, during the period in which, for what is it now, about 20 years of genome sequencing. And what we find is that the actual association levels are quite low. That is a wonderful fact from an embryological point of view, from an epigenetic point of view. Um, but nevertheless, in the long run, as an evolutionist, in the long run, as the generations go by, no matter how clever even if organisms do, do change what effect genes have, and I'm sure they do, nevertheless, in the long run, what matters is changes in gene frequencies in populations. And I'm talking as an evolutionist now, not as a physiologist or as an embryologist. Perhaps we could say that genes do two quite different things. In embryology, what they do is influence phenotypes in highly complicated ways including the ways you've just enunciated. But from an evolutionary point of view, what matters is the ones that are still here 10,000 years hence.